I'm going to be providing uh, some of these resources I was talking about and saying where you can kind of look for answers to things that you might have questions about. Um, so yeah, stay calm is the, uh, don't panic if we're going with the checkers guide. Uh, most issues can be solved through, yeah, perseverance and some light research and not to let yourself be stopped by nervousness or a feeling like you're doing it wrong or a fear of doing it wrong because you'll probably, even if you don't get like it perfect and maybe you produce a few less mushrooms, you'll still produce mushrooms. Or, you know, maybe you learn from that first experience and then you do better the next time. Um, best thing is just to keep, keep working at it. Uh, I will, yeah, provide some resources, as I said. Um, and yeah, you can, there's a lot of stuff available and you can really go as deep into it as you want. I'm, I'm a good example because I went into a PhD for it and like this stuff that you learned there is definitely not necessary for what we're doing. So by you, you can know that and it, it just informs your understanding of all the processes. Um, so yeah, we're going to be starting off by going over some uh, basic um, fungal info, just uh, I don't know where people's like knowledge and skill level is on this, but it's going to be um, some of just the basics that I think are important for understanding uh, fungi as an organism, and hey, uh, and uh, it'll help. Just that basic understanding will help with the process of cultivation. It's like understanding the basics of what a plant is, you know. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do in terms of the demo, like practical sort of stuff, is uh, grain substrate um, preparation. And as you see on your vocab list, uh, substrate refers to what you're growing, you know, the fungi in, what it is basically uh, moving through and digesting to produce more of the vegetative body. Another uh, thing on your list, which is basically just the uh, growth stage, the main growth stage, the uh, growth that is not producing mushrooms. It's just building the body of the mushroom, or the fungus, um, through the growth of uh, a network of thread-like cells, which we'll cover shortly. Um, and uh, that's fine. Um, we're going to be covering uh, basic sanitation uh, for reducing co um, contamination. A huge part of doing this effectively is knowing what to clean, when to clean, and you know what what to be concerned about, and that'll help you not be worried about the things that you don't which is how I started out, which was a nervous wreck whenever I did anything, because I needed everything clean all the time, and if anything got touched, I'd have to re-clean it. Not necessary. So knowing when to worry and when not to worry is a part of that. Um, and uh, so after that, uh, we're going to talk about just a basic um, way of um, protecting what you're inoculating from spores and bacteria without having to build a glove box, which is basically a, a structure that is hard to make unless you've got woodworking experience. And I've tried a few times and I can fail every time, so I've just come up with something that's a little bit more simple. I don't know if the tropics are going to have a, a heavier spore load, meaning, well, I know that they do, but um, whether or not this will be a problem, but there's a way we can adapt it in case it is by using a filter, but we'll, um, we'll go over that at the time. Uh, then um, we're going to do uh, some just inoculation in one of those boxes of the grain spawn. And um, and then go over uh, the incubation, basic incubation of uh, the grain spawn. Um, and then 
we will go and do the part which I, I like I developed myself. I mean, uh, environmental cabinets, as many of you may know, uh, are you know a, a, something that's used generally in um, in you know science labs as well as other um, things, uh, you know, commercial grows uh, for plants and stuff. Uh, basically, its purpose is to be able to control the environment, the humidity, the lighting, um, and I created a sort of a cheap and easy way of creating an environmental cabinet. Official environmental cabinets cost buckets of money, and uh, like for most people, that's not an option. Even if you're upscaling what I'm doing uh, to a larger grow operation, uh, this is going to be a lot cheaper than investing in something like an environmental cabinet. And it's effective. I have a, a really strong rate of growth um, and also a very low rate of contamination with this method that I developed. Um, and we'll be going over some of the specifics of that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> part of my um, method is this thing called, I call it a box and box, but there's other people who call their things box and box. Um, it's basically inside the environmental cabinet there are smaller things which are filtered, which have your um, culture inside, which allow for basically like not only the first level of protection and environmental control, but a second level inside. Um, and we'll be making some of those. Oh yeah, we'll be making the environmental cabinet too. Um, got everything, yes. Um, and then uh, we're going to be preparing some secondary substrate this morning, which is um, for a tray method, which is what I'll be teaching, what um, the grain spawn can go into to grow out more so that it can have a big body and fruit. Um, and then I'll be touching on um, uh, filter bag um, use, which is another way other than the trays, uh, for some fungi that grow laterally from their substrate. So like oyster mushrooms grow this little shelf. Um, you need to create an environment where they can do that, so you use bags uh, generally. Whereas trays are used for things that grow vertically. Um, primarily. And then we'll have uh, time, you know, for discussing like modification, innovation, and expansion. So I encourage everybody to take what I'm talking about and make it your own. Do whatever you think that you can to improve it. And, uh, you know, if you want to let me know, I'm always happy to, to learn what people have done to innovate. Um, and yeah, so that's that's an overview. Um, and we'll start in on the uh, the first part, which is going to be just to talk about some basic fungal info. All right. Yeah. So quickly, just to run over the vocab, I guess um, we talked a little bit about vegetative growth, which is just the non-reproductive growth increasing in size, basically. It would be the green growth of a plant. Um, I mean, that makes sense. It's the body of the fungus. Um, and, you know, a, a larger amount of the vegetative growth allows potentially for more, like, mushroom production. Um, vegetative growth happens generally when conditions are good. So moisture levels are right. Uh, it's um, the temperatures are good for growth, it's whatever is their optimal thing. And um, some, like some plants as well, the time when they start trying to reproduce and produce uh, structures for reproduction is sort of when the environment starts changing to be less uh, hospitable to growth. Is the vegetation growth during uh, the incubator stage? 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm talking more generally, but in, in this method, yes, it would be during the incubation stage. Let's see if I can get a, you know what, I can just do this. Um, yeah, I know. I used to live in New England, and I miss it when it's not winter. Right, yeah. Um, I lived in Massachusetts on and off for like nine years. Um, I lived in the Berkshires and then in the Happy Valley in uh, the Smith area and Amherst area. And then in Worcester, which is where I was at Clark. So um, this is an example of, let's see of vegetative growth. Oh. Uh, I mean, everyone can see this all right, right? Yeah. yeah, so this is, you know, the the this is called mycelium, which is another one of the, the words on the list there, which is basically, um, it's the body of the fungus. Uh, and they use those to explore their environment and to find resources, they sense, um, you know, their environmental, uh, they have ways of sensing their environment and finding uh, resources, um, which we're still learning uh, how they do that, but you know, every day we learn more on it. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Okay, uh, so back to this. So um, I will show you a picture of Hyphy. Um, Haifi or Haife, people pronounce it however they want, um, are the individual strands of um, the individual strands that make up the mycelium. So each one of those thread like um, collections of cells basically you know you've got cells that form um, these threads uh, each one of those is called a hyphae which is like the singular like the most reduced body of the fungus if you will um, and they again they explore the environment and uh, do basic, they're, they're the way that the, uh, the fungus interacts with its environment. Um, they digest the food that they find outside of their body and then absorb it, which is unique. Mm -hmm. um, so hyphae or hyphae are basically like uh, hyphae to mushrooms are what roots are to plants. Yeah. Kind of. In yeah. Way. I mean, they function differently. But. So each one of these is a hyphae, um, and then the mass of them is mycelium. Does that make sense? It's uh, individually they're hyphae, uh, in a network or mass they become mycelium. That's just the reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just to finish up with the vocab real quick, growth medium, is the same as substrate, it's what you're growing the thing in, and inoculation just basically means uh, adding the microorganism to the substrate that you want it to grow in. Um, and in the case of what we're doing, it's mycelium. Um, we're not using spores, uh, and we'll go over why that is later. Okay. Yes? Okay. Um, so, you know, there's lots of fun mushrooms you can grow. Um, the, there's two, like, well, there's many types, but um, the types that we can grow are, um, in, by this method, are decomposing fungi. Uh, there's alternatively, some of the big fungi are grown from a connection with the roots of plants. Those are called mycorrhizae. There's some that can be cultivated, but this isn't how you do that. Um, I need to turn that off.
Um, so yeah, that'll just be venting for a little bit, but it'll get quiet. Okay, so moving along. Um, I just got some pictures that I wanted to show to uh, elucidate some of the things that I've been talking about. So here are some pictures of the environmental cabinet that I, this one's stylized, but. Hey Ed, would you hit the timer? I forgot to turn that off. Yeah. This is a this is a picture of the environmental cabinet that I produced. Um, so it it uses um, you know kitchen you know stainless steel adjustable shelving uh, as the base of it, uh, and then heavy contract like plastic sheeting wrapped once this way and once that way um, to form. Uh, basically, you know, um, an environment that is maintainable inside using zip ties to attach it to the structure and also to form a reservoir at the bottom, um, which this is my old house and never had a spill once from that, so, and it's carpeting, so that'd be great. <laughs> um, yeah, they have them at Costco. And these are some shiitake that I was growing um, for my research at the time, and some flamulina, which is enoki, um, I think. Uh, and then, yeah, you can see there's uh, lighting through it and um, a humidifier, ultrasonic humidifier, which we'll go over later. The lighting is just strips of LEDs, super cheap and easy. And you can buy them on Amazon with a sticky back, so you can just stick them on. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's it closed. My house is messy. Um, that's just a pressure cooker. Um, I haven't been able to find one that's very big, so I've been doing small batches. Um, and then some stylized pictures of it that use a light that's totally not useful for it because it's for plants. <laughs> the red spectrum. Right. The red spectrum isn't the red spectrum isn't good for uh, the fungi. They like more the blue light. Okay. Um, so I've got some pictures here too. Oh no. <laughs> Um, just uh, real quick, this is like your basic life cycle of, um, you know, a mushroom producing fungi, you know, two spores, uh, uh, like germinate, there's, they actually are, you know, basically they both have half of the genetic information that forms an adult, so we're, we have basically, you know, um, the information of both of those would be combined when the sperm meets the egg, but they can grow separately, individually, as if the sperm grew into a, like a semi-person and the egg grew into a semi-person. And then when they find each other and they're compatible, they fuse and they form um, uh, like an adult hyphae, basically. And instead of combining like a sperm and an egg do, they just sit in the same cell uh, side by side until they decide to make. Uh, Are there sperm and eggs in the spores? No, that's a that's a mam mammalian thing, but oh, okay. or not necessarily. But they, they have spores, but they have they have different mating types. Mm -hmm. So we just call them plus and minus. Okay. Uh -huh. um, it's complicated. I, I don't I don't I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you could look it up, but it's uh it's basically um, chemistry. What? It's their it's their uh, DNA. Like it they know. Um, I could I could Yeah. I could look up a more specific um, answer, but it's gonna it's also gonna be pretty complicated. Um, so yeah, uh, let's just go on here. So they, they grow out with this, um, it's called dicaryotic, meaning just both of the things are in each cell. 
and then they form knots, which turn into primordia, which are basically like baby fungi. And then the growth process is actually just expansion. They, um, they weave the, the, the fungus, the, the fruiting body is actually like woven together hyphae. It's, uh, it's composed of just the hyphae that wove together almost like you know, knit or crocheted a 3D structure and then expand. So what is that word, sclerotia? Sclerotia, this is a different sort of way that things could get there. It's, um, it's sort of like a, a hyphal resting stage. So it's like a, a huge knot of this dicaryotic fungi form, or um, hyphae uh, form, and basically sit in the soil until the um, environmental uh, Characteristics are, are are right to uh, form like fruiting bodies. It's just a different way of doing it, and um, that's kind of more like a different mushroom strains go through these different processes. Yeah, basically. I mean, you could um, you could think of it as sort of like um, an uh, an overwintering form, so like um, something that allows it to persist. While like protecting its um, you know uh, humidity and um, all that in the soil when it's not right for it to be fruiting, and then once it gets to be like good conditions, then it would go through the same stage. And scler sclerotia. Scler scler yeah, um, and then yeah, at this point uh, you've got the spore formation and those two. Um, those two nuclei finally combined and they form the next generation. Um, so this is a sort of, let's see. This is to illustrate kind of the concept that we're going to be covering today um, of how you can use mycelium to basically expand um, your spawn or what, what you're using to inoculate your mycelium. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> this is showing an agar plate, but we're going to use, you know, a mycelium that's already been grown out uh, to inoculate an initial jar. And then, uh, if you wanted to, um, after that initial jar colonizes and you get, you prepare a bunch of other jars, you can take that one jar and expand what you've got by just spreading it into all of those. And What's in the jar? The jar, so the substrate we're working with today is uh, grain spawn. Uh, we're going to be working with wheat berries. Um, preferably uh, rye is used, but I haven't been able to find rye berries. So, uh, not in this part, but vermiculite will be in the second berry. Um, I'm sure you could, but it, it's not sort of the method that we'll, we'll be using. What? It wouldn't have any food. Yeah, it, it's, it, you would use it to help maintain moisture levels, also to create sort of pockets of aeration that they can grow through. Um, anyway, this is just to show how you can sort of expand the stock that you have using the methods we'll be looking at today. Um, that's the kind of pressure cooker I like to use. Um, I haven't been able to find it. It's um, really big, and you can have two levels of jars. Um, I'm not only able to do three quarts at a time in there. Um, yeah, so hopefully we'll be able to find one of those sometime later for the farm or order one online. Um, so you put the grain in the jars and the jars in the pressure cooker? Yeah, and, and, and we'll cover that. Um, but yes, uh, the, the grain goes into the jars uh, after it's been sort of given the right um, humidity um, or hydration, and then it's um, put into the pressure cooker to sterilize it. Um, and yeah, this is just to show sort of like what an industrial scale operation might look like if you were had a those are 
bunch of gallon jars, so a very large operation. And the, you know, mycelium uh, permeating the grain. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I guess these, these, yeah, these aren't very high quality. So I'll look for other pictures later. This was just to show, you know, sort of after three days and after eight days of growth in a jar. Um, we'll see if any of these actually come out well. Uh, so this is just to show the expansion from one point of inoculation through the substrate until it colonizes everything. Um, and yeah, there's other things you can do with mycelium, including um, putting it into wood chips and turning it into a garden. Uh, we're not going to cover that today, but maybe I'll come back sometime and do that. Um, and yeah, this is an example of just a uh, tray, the, you know, uh, tray fruiting. So it is what it sounds like. It's a tray. And, uh, you know, this is uh, your, 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 your regular, you know, white button mushroom um, that you find in the store growing out of that, um, which won't grow well here because of the temperature. And this alternatively is some bag spawn. So a uh, bag with the fungi growing out the sides, or in some cases, you can open up the top and have them grow out the top. That's kind of like an example of what you were talking about with having uh, mushrooms that grow laterally. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. So with um, with those, you kind of want that. <laughs> And um, maybe I'll be able to order some that we can use for the spawn that we produce today before I leave. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, this is again just sort of to show like the process, you know, the, the sterilization of the grain medium, the inoculation of the grain medium. Um, so the growth, and then the things you can do, laying it out on a tray, inoculating like a bulk substrate, like um, rye grasses, straw, things like that, um, or producing, you know, uh, log cultures, which means, you know, um, you inoculate wooden dowels, which are just basically like wooden nails almost, or plugs. And then, you know, you drill holes in a log and put them in there, and eventually you get mushrooms coming out of those logs. I'm not teaching that because on any kind of uh, scale other than just home growth, they're really impractical. It's very hard to turn a profit. Um, yeah, and so you can see tray culture, just different ideas of what you can do. Um, and I guess I just wanted to show a filter bag, but it's a terrible picture. Let me just pull one up. Yeah, they, they actually are the ones I was thinking of ordering from. There's um, lots of uh, producers here, these materials, and again, I'll cover that in the, uh, the addendum that I'll put out later. So yeah, it's just, uh, you can see the growth coming through the substrate, which is just the uh, browner parts, and then the growth is the white parts. Um, and eventually, once those are like fully colonized, you put them into you know your environmental chamber, and uh, you would you know poke holes in the sides so that it could fruit out of those holes. All right. Um,
Let's move on. Um, I am going to... So this is a website called The Shroomery, which is like mostly for people growing hallucinogenic mushrooms, but the thing is is that the community is just really dedicated to producing actually quite good information in terms of um, certain things. For instance, I use this website for the production recipe for my secondary um, substrate, which uh, we're going to be producing today to hopefully use in a um, trade culture later. Um, but first, let us go on to the grain spawn. So we'll move on from the TV here over to the kitchen. Pass this around. Mm -hmm. This is what they look like before they're cooked. Wow, they like double. Yeah. Do they have to, I mean, do they have pesticide on them? Do they have to be? They're feed green. No. Feed green? Yeah. Usually um, anything that you purchase from a store that you would feed to your animals is untreated with anything that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just, uh, also, you, I mean, you can go organic, you don't need to. You just don't want it to be treated with fungicide. Yeah, just mm -hmm. keep passing that around. Because uh, if it is, then you're kind of screwed. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, we've got two sizes of jars here. In, in most production, you're going to have uh, folks using these uh, quart jars. And I've got some of those here. Uh, I've also got some pint jars. Uh, or wait. What's half a quart? Pint? Yeah. Pint jars. Um, and <clears throat> this is more the size we use in a lab. Um, if you want to produce you know, a bunch of small ones, risk less grain, you can do that. Uh, it's just half of the grain. So I'm going to show two methods for the production. Um, so as you can see, there's a pretty big difference between what these look like before and after. Um, the whole point of that is trying to get uh, the moisture content uh, up in all the grains evenly and uh, so that they uh, can basically be a good substrate for the fungus. If they're too dry, the fungus will grow slowly and patchily. If they're too wet uh, or if they're exploded, the, the likelihood of bacteria or other contaminants growing increases. So uh, these methods sort of show a way of trying to get that uh, right. Um, so the first method I'm going to show you is this one. And we can make some of these in a little bit. But um, basically what this is, is, um, and I'll send out the recipe as well, uh, this is uh, a half a cup of the uh, grain, and then I just basically submerged it in water and left it for 24 hours. This allows the uh, grains to absorb the water as well as for 
maybe heat resistant spores to um, germinate, uh, allowing them to be more easily destroyed when we put them into the pressure cooker. Um, is, it, is it, you said a half a cup, is it equal parts grain and water? Uh, so or? this is, this is the water and this is not necessarily specific. Uh, this is just to soak them. Uh, we, we're going to empty that and then we're going to put in, um, I think it's a, I have to look it up. I think it's a thir two, two thirds of a cup. No, wait. It's going to be because that's half of it, so. Uh, I, I have to look it up. Um, so, uh, after, after this, what would be done is uh, to drain that and then add some water and uh, basically then to put it into this. Uh, and the water in the jars basically cooks into the grain uh, while it's in here. Um, the thing about that, though, is because part of the grain is submerged and part of it's above the water, you get a patchy distribution of um, the you know moisture. So I used a different method, which is the second method we'll be covering. Um, does anyone have any questions about that first? I know I'm going a little bit fast. It's also because I prefer this method, and I encourage people to use this method. Um, but that is another one. And we can, we can finish up that production in a little bit. <clears throat> the second method, which is, yes? Today we're going to be growing um, oysters. Yeah, so we'll be uh, producing grain spawn for oysters. The tray method that we're going to be uh, studying for the, um, the like actual mushroom growth part isn't really a good fit for oyster mushrooms. It can be done, but they will be weirded out. They might not grow, and they, if they do, they'll be very strange structures. Um, but the thing is, is that the box-in-box box method that I'm uh, showing today, you can put bags in the second box as well. So it's also applicable. Um, I'm just showing you the thing that I have the equipment for right now. Would you mind filling this up? Thank you. Um, OK. So let me just. Open this. So this is the best fit I could find for what we're doing in terms of a pressure cooker. Um, so it's not really necessary right now, but I like to just wear my nitrile gloves all the time. Um, So this is. Uh, Thank you. I just want to review this. This is this is meat berries that have been soaked that then go in there to be sterilized. Yeah, we're, we're going to go over that. Um, so I don't know. Did everybody get a chance to see this? Should I pass it around? Well, that's okay. Good. Yeah, and you know you can see that they're not all stuck to the bottom. You can move them around, which is important. Uh -huh. um, and the way that we produce this type is by first, instead of soaking it overnight, uh, we boil the grain for about an hour. Or not, you don't want a, like a heavy boil. You just basically want hot water that you're steeping it in with maybe a, like a bit of a, a simmer at the most. Uh, and then to, What you're saying is that mimics this? This is, this is what I put in before autoclaving, or before pressure cooking, okay. which produces this. Gotcha. The reason yeah. why I like this better is because the moisture is evenly distributed through all the grains, and as long as you're not overcooking them, um, you're not going to get many burst grains, and you, know, you just don't want them sticking to the bottom or anything. Um, so we'll be putting this into some jars. 
to uh, <coughs> pressure cook. Um, and um, oh yeah, let me one other thing. So um, because this is becomes really highly pressurized, uh, you want it at least 15 psi um, for one hour at least. Um, you can't have a seal on it like these would have, um, or they'll shatter from the expansion of the air in there. Uh, so two ways that you can uh, generally see people uh, deal with that is either to create um, tops out of uh, aluminum foil, uh, or to take um, the lids and switch them out so that they're upside down. That actually works pretty well. Um, what, so when they flip upside down, they're not completely yeah. sealed? Yeah, gotcha. so the gasket, and you don't want to tighten it down like hardcore, you know, just uh, while it's in there, tighten it, but leave it a little loose. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna put these back into here. Just it's a cleaner environment, um, and we'll we'll make some right now. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> we'll also cover that. But the way that you inoculate them is um, by yeah, I'm taking that off, trying to keep it, you know, sort of covered, but and then putting some spawn in, and then closing it, shaking it up. Um, I mean, yeah, there's the potential, but you know, that's sort of the um, you know uh, reason behind some of the sanitation and box stuff we'll be doing. So. Um, We'll cover that a little bit later. Um, I'm just going to close this up. So these ones I just made. Um, after they're pressure cooked, kind of want to shake them up just so you don't get clumping. It's a little hot. You always want to make sure that you didn't accidentally cause um, a fracture in the glass because you don't want it to break on you. And the, the reason I'm shaking them up is so that <clears throat> the grains don't stick uh, or like clump at the bottom, which allows for better um, uh, travel of the mycelium through them and also less chance of contamination and also um, a better uh, ability to inoculate your secondary substrate uh, when you're done because each kernel is going to be covered in mycelium and so when they break apart and they can travel to different parts of the secondary substrate, each kernel is a point that the fun fungus will grow out of. Yeah. Oh, I also just wanted to say that whenever um, whenever we want to, we can take a break. Uh, I, uh, I can get a bit focused, so. Uh, and there's a restroom right over there uh, in that hallway to the left, in case anyone needs it. <clears throat> so um, these that you're pulling out are sterile. Yeah, these are, they're really hot though, so you kind of, I mean, um, Preferably what you do is you almost you inoculate them almost like immediately after they're cooled. But you can store them uh, as long as you have sort of a clean environment. And you know, these don't look like they'd protect it, but they do. Uh, it's what we use in the lab. And it's basically just, and we'll go over this, it's just one layer of aluminum foil and then another. Uh, so, just wanted to quickly, one quick aside, as with many things, this is one of your best friends. It's always good to just jot down what you're doing and your results, keep track of things so you can refer back to it. Um, okay, so, let's see. some of these 
going. So we've got new jars here, but you know you can reuse jars, of course. Um, you know, just basically you want to clean all the large stuff off of them that you know um, bacteria or fungus could be hiding in. Um, So, I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it, but yeah, you're, it, it's that's more just like cleaning all of the particulate off, so all of the larger material, because they're going to be sterilized again, but if there's larger bits of material, sometimes uh, things can survive that process. Oh, one other thing is like, you'll see that there's two different types of jars here in terms of um, the mouth wideness, so these are you know, regular and those are wide mouth. Um, regular are better. Uh, you won't lose as much humidity. It's, it just ends up being better. There's some older you know, techniques that called for that, and so they were popularized, but these tend to be better for what we're doing. So, that there. I've got the grain that I cooked earlier here, and we'll see. We'll see if we can fill these two larger pork jars. Um, and you're, what you're going for in terms of the amount is about two thirds optimally. Like you can do less, but creating the airspace, um, you, you want to limit the airspace and by the, you know, have enough to where you can shake them around and get things going. And, you know, uh, periodically sanitizing your gloves with some alcohol is always a good idea. Do you only use alcohol or do you ever use like bleach? Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, bleach is also an option. Uh, I used to only use bleach back when I was in um, my undergraduate. The thing is, is you deal with bleach burns, and um, I like re-sterilizing more often than probably necessary, or sanitizing, and so um, alcohol is sufficient. Um, yeah, there's, you can use bleach for things but it's not necessary. I just kind of wanted to have it there as like, it's an option. Yeah. So, you know, if possible, you also want to limit um, the contact with the medium on the outside so as to, you know, prevent any excess sugars from being on the outside, allowing for things to grow up and around the cap. But you don't need to be too careful. And, you know, because this is feed, there's also some little bits of stuff in there that aren't really appropriate. You want to avoid those, but I don't think it's too big of an issue. Well, it's about, it's about two thirds. That's about what you want. And then um, take the Reynolds wrap. And we can just split that in half. One and two. Wow, that one, two, that simple, huh? Yeah. yeah. And you can yeah. just, you know, if you want to, you can tuck it in, but you don't have to. And so that one's ready to get autoclaved, or um, pressure cooked. I'll just if you had an autoclave, that would be just like yeah. the deal breaker right no, there. No, it's, like, it's really nice. Um, <laughs> So did I did I show people these? It pretty much looks the same as after they're uh, 
pressure cooked, but it's just they're already pre-plumped from that, and so that's good. And um, so because we're doing a stage which is going to be um, sterilized uh, right after it, meaning like this grain is going to go into the pressure cooker. We don't need to worry so much about sanitization or spore drop or anything like that. So it's kind of okay for this grain to just be here. Uh, you wouldn't want to leave it there overnight. Um, and you know, if we were doing a more sensitive part, I would probably uh, clean everything down with bleach beforehand. Or, I mean, not bleach, um, with alcohol. No, they, it'll just uh, it'll flow through the spaces because um, it's not a perfect seal there. It might puff up, but it won't explode. And um, by the time this is finished, you know we'll have uh, opportunity for folks to try inoculating their own jar after we do some of the other stuff. And with this one, I'm going to use the other type. And I've used both. Um, I think they're roughly equivalent. Again, the sort of lab standard is that one. So that's what I've become used to. Oh, no, it did it yeah. I think you're right. I think a piece of corn fell in there. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, fine. It's like, yeah. But, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't, I think it would probably be more likely to, you know, be food to a competitor. So I'm not mm -hmm. looking to include it necessarily. It'd probably be fine. Awesome. I don't know if I can whittle. All of them, yeah. yeah. You're going in there, corn. We'll yeah. see what happens. It's an experiment. Yeah. or anything in it because it can explode. Um, and basically what it does is it, um, it it cooks it under both heat and pressure, allowing, um, I don't know, I can't remember exactly why, but it, it helps with the, the process of or, uh, sterilization. Um, so I'm going to use this water. It's already boiled uh, to bring the water level up to two thirds. Any uh, pressure cooker you use will have, you know, its own manual. Uh, you want to make sure to follow the directions because, again, they're potentially dangerous. Um, and you also don't want to like run it dry or anything like that. So this one has a line on the side which you fill it up to. I'm just checking to make sure those aren't 
or really tight. And, and then I'm watching out for this stuff so as not to poke a hole in anything. Lining up the, the arrows to close it. Sliding it shut, locking it, putting it in the second position. For mine, that means 15 PSI, which is the, temp or the pressure that we want it under to be able to uh, have proper uh, sterilization in an hour. And then <clears throat> I'm just going to turn on the stove on high. And that's going to start boiling eventually, and um, once it does, steam will start coming out of this valve here, um, and that's the time when you want to start your timer, because that's when the you know pressure is built up to the right level, and so that's when um, you're basically starting your uh, sterilization cycle for an hour. Um, any questions? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's basically like canning, but... It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, it is. So that's what I'm trying to convey is really an at-home, easy method where you don't need an autoclave. You preferably would have something, a, 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 you know, a pressure cooker that's larger than this. This is um, seven quarts, so I can only make three quarts of spawn in there because that's all the jars I can fit. Which is kind of like what you were saying, it's pretty fine for an at-home, for-yourself thing, right? Yeah, I'm, it is. I prefer to have a lot more, um, <laughs> even at home. Um, I like to be able to make a lot of grain spawn, because then if one of the jars fail, you have more, and you know, you're not spending the time with like the sterilization. It, it ends up saving time. Yeah. And you know, if you store them correctly, jars can last a bit. Um, jars like with the without being inoculated. Without you you want to use them within a day or two, but, but they can't you know, inoculated. yeah. If you put them in a really clean place, that yeah. Or better refrigerator. Um, not before they're inoculated. More like a like a, a, a clean box, you know, that you sprayed down with alcohol. Um, Just to keep them at room temperature, right? It's, if you want to keep it... It's more just because like what you're worried about more at that stage is like airflow and spore drop and stuff like that. So if you have a, a clean box like this that's been you know sprayed down with alcohol and then closed up, <coughs> It's pretty clean. There's probably a not not a lot of food in there for any kind of bacteria or fungi to grow. You've you know sanitized it, so you've lowered the microbial community count, and it can sit in there pretty well. I mean, if you had a seal on it, maybe you'd be longer. But your grain is going to dry out over time too, so that's the other reason you want to use it fairly quickly. Um, so the next step would be uh, to create, to start making the secondary um, substrate. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and then uh, come back. Sure. I'm going to just get this water boiling and we're going to, uh, the way that we produce this uh, Secondary part is basically a bucket pasteurization of cocoa coir and vermiculite, which just means pouring, you know, boiling water onto it, stirring it up and covering it, and then leaving it hopefully like a total of three hours, but we'll see how long we have. It'll get better with more time, but it'll be fine. Yeah.
it is advised to um, use water than, other than tap water because of the chloramine in it, which is an antimicrobial, but I haven't had trouble with it. It's going to be sort of like if you do, then you want to look into something else. Uh, there's certain kinds of filtering or, um, oh, right, I'll put this on. Um, how do I? Um, you can just put that in your pocket or in your. Uh, uh, is that good? That's great. Thank you. With my hair back and everything. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, chloramine in the water. I haven't had an issue with it. Um, if you do have issues with the growth, like it just seems like something's wrong, it's not growing, and you can't think of anything else, maybe try using uh, some like uh, distilled water or um, something like that, uh, water that you get from a like a bottle. Um, there again, there are sort of filtering things that you can use, but um, I haven't had to, so. In the lab, all of our, <clears throat> um, all of our water that we use is DI, deionized, uh, and, you know, pretty clean. Um, but again, I haven't had an issue with it. Um, so what we're doing now is just prepping the secondary growth medium, which is what we would put the spawn jars into after they've grown the mycelium uh, to basically uh, bulk them up and then eventually have them fruit. So about, as I announced, about how long is the, the in-between? So once you have your jars set up, how long does it take to the, to get them colonized? To get them colonized before yeah. to get to this phase. Yeah, it's going to depend on your fungus and it's going to depend on, um, you know, the environment and how well suited your fungus is to that environment. But with, um, you know, a healthy oyster um, culture that is, uh, like, environmentally, like, suited, um, You'll usually get uh, a lot, a pretty good, you know, amount of um, of growth over three days. You'll start to see it, uh, you know, around in the the jar, and then at that point you can shake it up, which uh, basically moves those kernels around again to create more inoculation points. Um, That's yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's at that point, then it, it'll grow. It'll probably take another three, four days, and then it'll be um, closer to be ready to be used. So you want the kernels, you know, to, you want to see like growth pretty much throughout, like, um, but you don't want, you after it's fully colonized, meaning there's growth throughout the jar, you don't want to give it too much time, otherwise, it'll bulk up in a way where you can't break the kernels apart. So at about the time when it fully colonized, that's when you want to use it so they don't just turn into one solid mass. So this is Coco Coir. I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's the husk underneath the coconut and it's been, you know, pulverized into this material. It's good because uh, the decomposing fungi, most of them can eat it, and it also provides sort of a, a good, I don't know, physical substrate for them to grow. And what we're going to do is we're going to pasteurize it. Uh, we don't need to sterilize it, so we're going to do that with boiling water, and we're going to add vermiculite so as to create uh, air pockets as well as uh, water, better water retention. And to do that, we're going to use this <coughs> very fancy five gallon bucket and we're going to put it in there. And when you're using a five gallon bucket you probably want to start with a fairly clean one. Like 
Yeah, you don't want to be using it for soil. So yeah. We should have a dedicated bucket for this. Yeah, just because like you don't want a bunch of like resistant spores in there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess we could clean it out, but it's from the store. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. just asking because we have some buckets, but. No, my mom uh, bought some though. So we could. Yeah. Those yeah, like she bought Perfect. way more than is necessary. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll provide. I'll provide a recipe for this, but um, one of the sort of, you know, um, ratios that's often used is 60-40. 60, 60 of the uh, coco coir to 40 of the vermiculite. I'm doing something a bit more simple, which calls for one block of coco coir, which is not an exact measurement. They're talking about those brick-sized blocks that they have that come in small amounts. I feel like this is approximately that size, maybe a bit larger. And so the recipe that I've got calls for one block of the coco coir, um, uh, two quarts of vermiculite, and then four quarts of boiling water. Um, I'm gonna get a quart jar so I can measure that out easily. Now, as you can see, the vermiculite here has got really small particle size. I prefer the larger kind, but this will work fine. Is that mixed with something besides vermiculite? I want some vermiculite. No, you're thinking of perlite. That's perlite, yeah. Perlite, perlite, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perlite is not good. Uh, you can use it, but vermiculite is a lot better. Vermiculite is more What's it made of? I. Mountain ash? Yeah. It's a mountain ash that gets cultivated in large amounts. It's a lot like azelite, where you can fiber. fiber. Um, it's a mineral. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So the fungus is not eating the vermiculite. The vermiculite's inert. Um, the fungus is eating the coco coir. I'm going to add a little bit more because I think that's a bit bigger than. Uh, one of the standard blocks. So for this size block, I'm going to just add, you know, two and a half quarts and just pour that into the bucket there. Um, so that's still going. But well, while those are getting ready, we'll start prepping for the next section. Um, which is, we're going to inoculate some of the jars that I produced earlier. Can I use a little bit of Um, Mom, you said that the you said that these ones are the newer ones. Because they changed their 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 label. Okay. But uh, hopefully they will be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly how doing the wheat berries in the jars connects to the secondary substrate. 
Okay. Yeah. So let me try to explain that a little more clearly. Just fill this up first. So let me use this as an example. Um, this is what we're going to use as our uh, inoculum, which is, you know, the mycelium we're using to inoculate the jars. It's just basically one of your, you know, commercially produced kits for oyster mushrooms. Um, preferably you'd get, you know, a strain from a company that's specifically like got environmental characteristics that are good for, yeah, look, there's fungus growing. Oh, wow. Oh, the oh. Was that a mistake that they made? Or? It's probably just, the, the culture's probably been in there for a while, so it, it like branched out. Wow. If we have time, I'll also show you how you can take just your average store mushrooms and use cardboard as a way to produce uh, mycelium that you can use for culturing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can also use these boxes too. Um, so we're going to use this to inoculate those jars. But imagine that this is like one of those completed jars. This is sort of like what it's going to be like. We're not going to let it get this dense because you can feel that's real dense, oh, yeah, yeah. which is going to be a oh, bit wow. okay. of an issue when we're trying to break it up to uh, use it. But um, so, the jar that we put away eventually going to grow into something that like, looks like that? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, well, so what's going to, yeah. So it takes like about, seven days. Uh, what, what's going to happen more though is like you're not going to let it quite become solid like this. You're just letting it go permeate permeate through all the grains. Um, and with the shaking that you're talking about while it's growing you don't want to shake it? Or? So you do but you want to give it a couple days first. Um, so the uh, let me try to explain this. Uh, so the mycelium, the hyphae, um, they're growing all over the grains. And the, the grains are good because not only are they a good food source, but they also break apart and you know move through the secondary substrate, creating a bunch of spots for inoculation. Every time one of the hyphae is broken and comes into contact with another food source, a new branch can grow out. So each time you break it up, you're creating a bunch of new points of growth. Okay, Does so that make it's sense? basically a lot of grass, but in <laughs> what we weed all the time. Yeah, yeah whenever so every time you make a breaking point, instead of actually breaking it in half, you're really just creating two. Different. Yeah, so every, yeah. every point that it breaks at and comes in contact with substrate, it can grow out from that point. So that's the reason for shaking it. All right. Um, and, and that's the reason for leaving it for a couple of days. Yeah. Let that, it yeah, let it do its thing first, and then then do that. So I'm breaking this up so we can use it in a little bit. They all seem to be a yeah. I mean, why don't why don't you grab one of the other ones and I'll open yeah I'll open that up too. Okay, so to try to explain better the connection between this and the secondary substrate, um, the reason for making the jars is so we're getting this to grow through the jars, creating a bunch of like grain that's covered in mycelium. Each of those grains becomes an inoculation point. The whole point of the grain thing is just basically to increase your uh, inoculum, your the fungus you have to work with. Um, yeah, and then the purpose of the secondary um, substrate is basically for fruiting. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, it looks robust. You can see this is 
this is excretion, sort of like pee. <laughs> can you can you wait just to like get the just wait and I'll get, make you some water. Um, yeah, this one's real dense. <laughs> I'll try the other one. That's a oversimplification. There's all sorts. Um, I mean, consider a yeast. Those are very simple genetically, and they're also a fungus. Are you okay with us just popping and squatting? Yeah, that's fine. Not at all. Yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to need to clear uh, we're going to need to clear some of this stuff so that I can clean that counter uh, I'll, I'll put some water in there for you mom maintain that sort of clean environment. Uh, also just being aware of the airflow and, you know, closing windows, things like that. So I'm just going to simply spray this down, all the surfaces, maybe, you know, rub it around, and then stick it in there so that it is, you know, getting ready for use. Technically, you want like the alcohol to be in contact with the surface for a bit, but I just find the normal workflow is enough time. So, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't move super fast, but I feel like, you know, just a normal pace is fine. And I like to just rub down the skin on the arms. Yeah, it's gonna dry them out, but you know, we do have bacteria and stuff on there. Um, you can also get longer gloves if you don't want it on your skin. It's part of the reason I switched from bleach, because I would come home with bleach burns. Yeah. Yeah. So if those aluminum tops are ever compromised, is that like a well, you'll you'll be able to tell because you'll see contaminated t contamination growth. Do you mean like in the future when you during this prep process, let's say, like if it oh, falls off or something? Sure, like you could still try. Okay. I mean, I would, okay. uh, but yeah, the likelihood that it is contaminated increases. Okay. Again, it's one of those things where I suggest not worrying too much until you try it, you know, uh, in the sense of like, you know, I could, if I, if that happened to me, I could set that aside and be like, oh, I, I'm just going to assume this is contaminated or I could just try, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it just slipped off and then you put it back on, I'd still try. If it was sitting with it off for like a couple of minutes, yeah. I wouldn't, maybe. You could still try. Because like you're introducing like a lot of an organism which 
has the potential of, you know, having a lot more inoculum than the like spores that are going in there. So it could still outcompete. You know, that's the whole idea. Is you're trying to, you, we're probably going to have like some spores and stuff that get in there during this process. But what you're trying to do is create an environment where your microorganism can outcompete anything else. Yeah. So I'm going to pass this around. What I've basically done is just broken up the inoculum. So if this was grain, I'd be breaking up all the grain from each other. In this case, it's sawdust. No, it's sawdust. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just pass it this way first, and you can pass it back after. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so you can't necessarily, you mean you saw how it looked before really well. Did you get to feel them, the solid solidity? So like that sponginess is, that's mycelium. That means that that's pretty much a solid organism. Um, you know, yeah, there's the sawdust in there, but even inside the sawdust, there's, there's mycelium. Um, so any mycelium that are all connected is considered one organism? Uh, yeah. And then when you break it, it I mean, it, at that point, it's, you know, I guess becomes a bit more of a philosophical question. Um, in the sense that, like, that's actually what I studied in undergrad, is superorganisms. Um, so technically, if you're talking about it as a genetic organism, then it's one, even when it's broken apart. If you're thinking of it spatially, then it's many. But when it's broken apart, all those individuals that like got broken apart will eventually grow and fuse back together. So then it becomes one again spatially. I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that means that the sawdust wasn't treated and the trees weren't treated. Oh, okay. wow. Did you get to feel that? What we're doing right now is inoculating it from an already known source, right? Yeah. We know that this is oyster mushrooms. Right. So when you're preparing <coughs> something new, what you're wanting to do is to find a source like this to then expand upon. Um, yeah. So. So, for for instance, what 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 m m mostly you would do is you would order a culture that you want from a, a distributor that specializes in growing those cultures and then you would grow a little thing there. You can also just take it, fold it, uh, and tape it. Um, you know, but I, I, I have an impact sealer at home. They're not too expensive, but they're not also necessary. Um, so I'm going to put that in there, and I'm going to get a pair of scissors and clean those. No, because this one is, um, n this is way overgrown, and so it's really tough to break apart. You can, can feel it. So, you, so if I were to open another box, it would be a bunch more. So you have to check for I, I don't need one right now, because I've got more than enough. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, and I've already broken this one up and cleaned it. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, this one, looked like that before I broke it up. So it's actually quite well colonized. It's definitely completely colonized. And um, even though once you break it up, you can't necessarily see the whiteness on each of the little granules of our like, fibers, uh, it's still there. So you all might want to get up for this part. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to cut below the filter. Yeah, it's strong. Um, now, this is going to be way more than we need for two jars. But I'm basically, I'm just going to take that and lean it there and get this one ready. And because I'm used to doing it this side to this side with the, the uh, spawn and the jar, I'm going to take that and basically just try to get under there and, you know, peel this off, trying to keep the integrity, not breaking the aluminum, uh, trying to keep it somewhat covered like that, and really just try to get some of the inoculum in there. So there's some big chunks in there because of this being uh, an older culture. Oh, oh yeah, and then I just, uh, you know, take that and recover it. And we can just put that to the side for now. And then I'll take this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just interrupt you right now because I need to keep going. Um, so again, I'm gonna take this and just sort of get it so it's peeking through. Uh, not fully removing it. Okay, I, I tore the aluminum. So again, this sawdust is not the best. It'd be better to have grain, but since that got a little hole in the aluminum. I'm going to get another sheet. Thank you. And this time I'm just going to double it over. Um, spray it down. And I'm not going to take off the other one because that's already clean. You know, it's been sterilized. This hasn't been, um, this is probably more than enough to clean it because like, remember, there's no food on this. So there's not much growing on there. Um, but I'm just going to add that on. Like so. And you know, I could have just re-cleaned my hands, but um, we're done with this section for this moment. I'm going to um, just take that and cover it like so, and I'll take these out. Um, and I'm just going to take another second to spray things down. Maybe not necessary, but reassuring and stinky. Um, so if anyone else would like to try, we can do that now. We've got a few for now and then we can do more once the other jars finish and cool down. Would anyone like to try right now? I'd love to try it. Okay, here. Um, throw on some gloves. Um, oh. <laughs> so I'm going to put these in your prep area which is outside and You'll go ahead and clean them before you put them in there. Okay. Um, remember also to spray down your gloves and, and your yeah, yeah you, you can. Um, and I'll just set these to the side. So the kill rate is pretty fast with the huh? It's yeah. Oh, I mean, you want contact for longer, but it's okay. Yeah, and spray each one of these down. Yeah, just or yeah, you them. spray them down and you know just wipe them off. Oh, why, why don't uh, you do two and let someone else do two? 
No, I don't. Oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to have more jars later, too, so. Oh, okay. And then we're going to put a little more. Yeah, wherever you like, you know, it's kind of based on your dominant hand and all that. <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead and do those two? I'll uh, I'll be watching and helping. I'm just adding a bit more water to this. No, me do these two? Or why don't you go ahead and do those two? Oh, yeah. finish these out. Yeah. And then he can do the next two. Yeah. So. I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah so, so you can just up. yeah you can just loosen that all the way, but leave it on. You know, uh, yeah, you, you you can figure it out. Okay. Turn it the other way so that yeah there you go. You're basically here. Let me uh, yeah it was, just, it was easy to let see me glove up. The, um, yeah. Tin foil. Sorry, no, I didn't show cool. this. Um, so yeah, you're just gonna basically you loosen it up so that it's just sort of like sitting there, and then. You know, when, when you get that and that hand, you're just going to basically use your thumb to sort of like do that. And do that and yeah. then, gotcha, okay. Yeah, it's a, a little okay. different, but the, the idea is the same. Okay. And remember, this is a learning experience, so. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so I'm going to take this and just yeah. shake it in. And it yeah. looked like you didn't really You don't need that, that much, but I'll just tell you when. You can keep going. That's probably good. You want enough space so that you can still get the movement. Gotcha. And yeah, you can fully close it. Later we'll open it a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. Give it, give it just yeah, a just a little bit. air. Okay, gotcha. Alright, cool. Yeah. That's and nice. you want to be aware of just trying to keep, um, you know, more like your forearms and, and oh, not... Everything yeah, in. you're just trying not to get too much of like your exposed arm in there. Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. So like here. Yeah, it's sort of like as much as you need, but not more. Okay. And like, you know, remember that cloths, like your clothing and hair, uh, have more like bacteria and spores attached to them. So especially that's... Especially since we're filthy farmers. Huh? So especially since we're filthy farmers. Is that good? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, and you can actually tighten it all the way since we're going to shake them. Okay. We'll we'll um, we'll we'll uh, we'll loosen them up when we put them for incubation. Okay. And then all right. If this were the end, I would go ahead. Yeah. And kind of fold that up. Yeah, and and sen uh, you can just leave it there. If if this were actually like the very end and you wanted to try to save that, you'd spray it down again and you'd fold that over and then you'd tape it down pretty well. Um, I cut off the filter though, so that can't breathe. No um, breathing. Yeah. Suffocation. Would you like to? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so just, you know, clean off your hands, your forearms if you want, and then uh, would you turn off the uh, heat on that? Yeah. Yeah. Step out. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, if you want to leave your email, I can uh, also send you the materials that I'm going to be producing. If not, that's fine too. Um, sure. Um, the pink composition book is what I've been collecting them in. Oh, no, wait. I think that's it. Yeah. Should be the front page. Now you, you technically want to um, have them cleaned off by the time you put your, them in there. So oh, like spray them and spray them yeah, it. and then oh, okay. and then put it in while it's still wet. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Right. I'm just you don't don't worry. Right. <laughs> I'm just giving a, a, you know active feedback. Sure. And um, why don't you go ahead and just spray down the whole environment again? It's just good to do that periodically. Yeah. Because well, then you don't touch anything. You walk in, you go scalpel. 
<laughs> yeah. uh, they, they do the whole full scrub and gown and thing, and then they need to make sure. There, it actually matters if you touch something. Yeah, yeah. Every little bacteria yeah, that gets on your gloves your gets in surgery. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they were. And while we do that, uh, we can move on to the next section. I feel like we've kind of covered basic sanitation at this point. Um, and the inoculation box, its purpose, and the different options. Um, and uh, okay, so the next thing we can cover real quick is incubating um, the newly inoculated jars. Um, during the vegetative growth stage, most fungi prefer darkness. It's not absolutely necessary, but it'll be better. So you can get a larger uh, Rubbermaid that's black plastic, black top. Doesn't need filters put on it or anything. You can just put them in there. Um, clean it first and then put it in the sort of temperature range that is good for that incubation. And I'm gonna be providing materials that have resource uh, that uh, talk about what temperatures each fungi generally like. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you can, yeah, you can look up individual strains as well because there is some variation. Um, for instance, my hope is to get a strain of oyster mushrooms that's specifically uh, high heat so that you can have that uh, here. I'm also going out on a mushroom hike uh, to collect some wild um, and then I can maybe produce a culture from that which uh, would also be good because it then it's adapted to growing wild in the islands. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean um, wild capture and we'll go over that a little bit um, maybe while we walk and talk um, is another way that you can build up your culture <laughs> library and you can get things that are adapted for a given environment. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to build the environmental cabinet. <laughs> and I was thinking we could do that over, well, now I'm just thinking it's, yeah, it's pretty heavy. So we might just want to do it here and move it there. Okay. Um, you can always bring uh, the truck to move it. That might be good. Yeah, because um, the, the 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 metal shelving things are really heavy. So then we can go over to the packing shed. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna need a little bit of help with some of the stuff we need to take. Sure. Uh, it's over there. Are we done with our gloves? Yeah. yeah. Hey, gloves off? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, I can yep. go ahead and grab all Oh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, what do I so need? So then are we, we're going to go ahead and keep these things here for now? Yeah, they can just sit here for now. Um, yeah, and I just want to check in with people about time. How are you guys doing on time? Uh, honestly, uh, we're great. We set the whole afternoon aside okay. for this. Yeah. Great. I, I, yeah, I teach somewhat slower than some people, but I like it because it gives me the opportunity to answer questions and go in depth. Yeah, I'm uh, something that's used generally in, um, in you know, science labs as well as other um, things. Uh, you know, commercial grows uh, for plants and stuff. Uh, basically, its purpose is to be able to control the environment, the humidity, the lighting. Um, and I created a sort of a cheap and easy way of creating an environmental cabinet. Official environmental cabinets cost buckets of money, and uh, like for most people, that's not an option. Even if you're upscaling what I'm doing, uh, to a larger grow operation, uh, this is going to be a lot cheaper than investing in something like an environmental cabinet. 
and it's effective. I have a, a really strong rate of growth um, and also a very low rate of contamination with this method that I developed. Um, and we'll be going over some of the specifics of that. Um, and uh, <clears throat> part of my um, method is this thing called, so I call it a box in box, but there's other people who call their things box in box. Um, it's basically inside the environmental cabinet there are smaller things which are filtered, which have your um, culture inside which allow for basically like not only the first level of protection and environmental control, but a second level inside. Um, and we'll be making some of those. Oh yeah, we'll be making the environmental cabinet too. Um, got everything, yes. Um, and then uh, we're going to be preparing some secondary substrate this morning, which is um, for a tray method, which is what I'll be teaching, what um, the grain spawn can go into to grow out more so that it can have a big body and fruit. Um, and then I'll be touching on um, a filter bag um, use, which is another way other than the trays, uh, for some fungi that grow laterally from their substrate. So like oyster mushrooms grow as little shelf. Um, you need to create an environment where they can do that, so you use bags uh, generally. Whereas trays are used for things that grow vertically. Um, primarily. And then we'll have uh, time, you know, for discussing like modification, innovation, and expansion. So I encourage everybody to take what I'm talking about and make it your own. Do whatever you think that you can to improve it. And, uh, you know, if you want to let me know, I'm always happy to, to learn what people have done to innovate. Um, and yeah, so that's that's an overview. Um, and we'll start in on the uh, the first part, which is going to be just to talk about some basic fungal info. Um, Hi. Here's uh, just a basic vocabulary, which you know we need. And if you want to, I just went over this, which is the um, sort of the overview of what we'll be doing today. Most of these are notes for myself, but this first part is for everybody. And you can just see the light temperature and stuff in growth and also contamination risks. Um, so uh, I suggest that you practice what you learn here. And, uh, you, and you'll learn more from that, and you'll have more questions as you go. Not everything, what the little bit that I'm covering here does not make up from the, for the experience that you'll get from actually doing these things, and uh, I can't cover all the things that you'll, you'll encounter and have questions about, but I encourage, you know, Google searches, uh, there's a lot of material out there uh, from hobbyists and from professionals, as well as um, I'm going to be providing uh, some of these resources I was talking about and saying where you can kind of look for answers to things that you might have questions about. Um, so yeah, stay calm is the, uh, don't panic if we're going with the checkers guy. Uh, most issues can be solved through, yeah, perseverance and some light research and not to let yourself be stopped by nervousness or a feeling like you're doing it wrong or a fear of doing it wrong because you'll probably even if you don't get like it perfect and maybe produce a few less mushrooms you'll still produce mushrooms or you know maybe you learn from that first experience and then you do better the next time um best thing is just to keep, keep working at it uh i will yeah provide some resources as i said um, and yeah, you can. There's a lot of stuff available, and you can really go as deep into it as you want. I'm, I'm a good example because I went into a PhD for it, and like the stuff that you learned there is definitely not necessary for what we're doing. 
So by you, you can know that, and it, it just informs your understanding of all the processes. Um, so yeah, we're going to be starting off by going over some uh, basic um, fungal info. Just uh, I don't know where people's like knowledge and skill level is on this, but it's going to be um, some of just the basics that I think are important for understanding uh, fungi as an organism and hey, uh, and uh, it'll help. Just that basic understanding will help with the process of cultivation. It's like understanding the basics of what a plant is, you know? Um, so the first thing that we're going to do in terms of the demo, like practical sort of stuff, is uh, grain substrate um, preparation. And as you see on your vocab list, uh, substrate refers to what you're growing, you know, the fungi in, what it is basically uh, moving through and digesting to produce more of the vegetative body. Another uh, thing on the list, which is basically just the uh, growth stage, the main growth stage, the uh, growth that is not producing mushrooms. It's just building the body of the mushroom, or the fungus, um, through the growth of uh, a network of thread-like cells, which we'll cover shortly. Um, and That's fine. There we go. Um, we're going to be covering uh, basic sanitation uh, for reducing co um, contamination. A huge part of doing this effectively is knowing what to clean, when to clean, and you know what what to be concerned about and. That'll help you not be worried about the things that you don't need to do, which is how I started out, which was a nervous wreck whenever I did anything, because I needed everything clean all the time. And if anything got touched, I'd have to re-clean it. Not necessary. So knowing when to worry and when not to worry is a part of that. Um, and uh, so after that, uh, we're going to talk about just a basic um, way of um, protecting what you're inoculating from spores and bacteria without having to build a glove box, which is basically a, a structure that is hard to make unless you've got woodworking experience. And I've tried a few times and I can fail every time, so I've just come up with something that's a little bit more simple. I don't know if the tropics are going to have a heavier spore load, meaning, well, I know that they do, but um, whether or not this will be a problem, but there's a way we can adapt it in case it is by using a filter, but we'll, um, we'll go over that at the time. Uh, then um, we're going to do uh, some just inoculation in one of those boxes of the grain spawn. And um, and then go over uh, the incubation, basic incubation of uh, the grain spawn. Um, and then we will go and do the part which I, I like I developed myself. I mean, uh, environmental cabinets, as many of you may know, uh, are, you know, a rye berries. Let me know. Because yes. What is the one that you use in here? See, these are wheat berries. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Mm -hmm. This is what they look like before they're cooked. Wow, they like double. Yeah. Do they have to, I mean, do they have pesticide on them? Do they have to be? They're feed green. Mm -hmm. No. Feed green? Yeah. Usually, um, anything that you purchase from a store that you would feed to your animals is untreated with anything that. Yeah. yeah. You just uh, also, you. I mean, you can go organic, you don't need to. You just don't want it to be treated with fungicide. Yeah, just mm -hmm. keep passing that around. Because uh, if it is, then you're kind of screwed. <laughs> um, so uh, we've got two sizes of jars here. In, in most production, you're going to have uh, folks using these uh, quart jars. And I've got some of those here. Uh, I've also got some pint jars, 
Uh, or wait. What's half a quart? Pint? Yeah. Pint jars. Um, and <clears throat> this is more the size we use in a lab. Um, if you want to produce you know, a bunch of small ones, risk less grain, you can do that. Uh, it's just half of the grain. So I'm going to show two methods for the production. Um, so as you can see, there's a pretty big difference between what these look like before and after. Um, the whole point of that is trying to get uh, the moisture content uh, up in all the grains evenly and uh, so that they uh, can basically be a good substrate for the fungus. If they're too dry, the fungus will grow slowly and patchily. If they're too wet uh, or if they're exploded, the, the likelihood of bacteria or other contaminants growing increases. So uh, these methods sort of show a way of trying to get that uh, right. Um, so the first method I'm going to show you is this one. And we can make some of these in a little bit. But um, basically what this is, is, um, and I'll send out the recipe as well. Uh, this is uh, a half a cup of the uh, grain, and then I just basically submerged it in water and left it for 24 hours. This allows the uh, grains to absorb the water as well as for maybe heat resistant spores to um, germinate, uh, allowing them to be more easily destroyed when we put them into the pressure cooker. Um, is, it, is, it, is it a half a cup? Is it equal parts grain and water? Uh, so this is this is the water, and this is not necessarily specific. Uh, this is just to soak them. Uh, we, we're going to empty that, and then we're going to put in. Um, I think it's. Um, I have to look it up. I think it's a uh, two two thirds of a cup. No wait, it's going to be because that's half of it. So. I have to look it up. Um, so uh, after after this, what would be done is uh, to drain that and then add some water, and uh, basically then to put it into this. Uh, and the water in the jars basically cooks into the grain uh, while it's in here. Um, the thing about that, though, is because part of the grain is submerged and part of it's above the water, you get a patchy distribution of um, the you know, moisture. So I used a different method, which is the second method we'll be covering. Um, does anyone have any questions about that first? I know I'm going a little bit fast. It's also because I prefer this method and I encourage people to use this method. Um, but that is another one, and we can we can finish up that production in a little bit. <clears throat> the second method, which is yes, today we're going to be growing um, oysters. Yeah, so we'll be uh, producing grain spawn for oysters. The tray method that we're going to be uh, studying for the um, the like actual mushroom growth part isn't really a good fit for oyster mushrooms can be done, but they will be weirded out. They might not grow, and they if they do, they'll be very strange structures. Um, but the thing is, is that the box-in-box box method that I'm uh, showing today, you can put bags in the second box as well. So it's also applicable. Um, I'm just showing you the thing that I have the equipment for right now. Thank you. Um, okay. So let me just open this. One, two, and that's simple, huh? Yeah. yeah. And you can yeah. just, you know, if you want to, you can tuck it in, but you don't have to. And 
so that one's ready to get autoclaved or um, pressure cooked. If you had an autoclave, that would be just like yeah. the deal breaker right no, there. No, it's, like, it's really nice. Um, <laughs> So did I did I show people these? It pretty much looks the same as after they're uh, pressure cooked, but it's just they're already pre-plumped from that, and so that's good. So because we're doing a stage which is going to be um, sterilized uh, right after it, meaning like this grain is going to go into the pressure cooker, we don't need to worry so much about sanitization or spore drop or anything like that. So it's kind of OK for this grain to just be here. Uh, you wouldn't want to leave it there overnight. Um, and, you know, if we were doing a more sensitive part, I would probably uh, clean everything down with bleach beforehand. Or, I mean, not bleach, um, with alcohol. No, they, it'll just uh, it'll flow through the spaces because um, it's not a perfect seal there. It might puff up, but it won't explode. And um, by the time this is finished, you know we'll have uh, opportunity for folks to try inoculating their own jar after we do some of the other stuff. And with this one, I'm going to use the other type. And I've used both. Um, I think they're roughly equivalent. Again, the sort of lab standard is that one. So that's what I've become used to. It's yeah, fine, it's like, yeah. but you know, I don't, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I think it would probably be more likely to, you know, be food to a competitor, so I'm not mm -hmm. looking to include it necessarily. It'd probably be fun. I don't know if I can avoid all of them. All of them, yeah. yeah. You're going in there, corn. We'll <laughs> see what happens. It's an experiment. Yeah. or anything in it because it can explode. Um, and basically what it does is it, um, it, it cooks it under both heat and pressure, allowing, um, I don't know, I can't remember exactly why, but it, it helps with the, the process of, sanitary, or of sterilization. Um, so I'm going to use this water. It's already boiled uh, to bring the water level up to two thirds. Any uh, pressure cooker you use will have, you know, its own manual. Uh, you want to make sure to follow 
the directions because, again, they're potentially dangerous. Um, and you also don't want to like run it dry or anything like that. So this one has a line on the side which you fill it up to. I'm just checking to make sure those aren't overly tight. And, and then I'm watching out for this stuff so as not to poke a hole in anything. Lining up the, the arrows to close it. Sliding it shut, locking it, putting it in the second position. For mine, that means 15 PSI, which is the, temp or the pressure that we want it under to be able to uh, have proper uh, sterilization in an hour. And then <clears throat> I'm just going to turn on the stove on high. And that's going to start boiling eventually and um, once it does steam will start coming out of this valve here um, and that's the time when you want to start your timer because that's when the you know pressure is built up to the right level and so that's when um, you're basically starting your uh, sterilization cycle for an hour um, any questions okay yeah, it's, it's basically like canning, but... It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, it is. So that's what I'm trying to convey is really an at-home, easy method where you don't need an autoclave. You preferably would have something, a, 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 you know, a pressure cooker that's larger than this. This is um, seven quarts, so I can only make three quarts of spawn in there because that's all the jars I can fit. Which is kind of like what you were saying, it's pretty fine for an at-home, for-yourself thing, right? Yeah, I'm, it is. I prefer to have a lot more, um, <laughs> even at home. Um, I like to be able to make a lot of grain spawn, because then if one of the jars fail, you have more, and you know, you're not spending the time with like the sterilization. It, it ends up saving time. Yeah. And you know, if you store them correctly, jars can last a bit. Um, jars like with the without being inoculated. Without you you want to use them within a day or two, but, but they can't you last know, a day. yeah. If you put them in a really clean place, that yeah. What about in the refrigerator? Um, not before they're inoculated. More like a like a, a, a clean box, you know, that you sprayed down with alcohol. Um, Just to keep them at room temperature, right? It's, if you want to keep it... It's more just because like what you're worried about more at that stage is like airflow and spore drop and stuff like that. So if you have a, a clean box like this that's been you know sprayed down with alcohol and then closed up, <coughs> It's pretty clean. There's probably a not not a lot of food in there for any kind of bacteria or fungi to grow. You've you know sanitized it, so you've lowered the microbial community count, and it can sit in there pretty well. I mean, if you had a seal on it, maybe you'd be longer. But your grain is going to dry out over time too, so that's the other reason you want to use it fairly quickly. Um, so the next step would be uh, to create, to start making the secondary um, substrate. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and then uh, come back. I'm going to just get this water boiling and we're going to, uh, the way that we produce this uh, secondary part is basically a bucket pasteurization of cocoa coir and vermiculite, which just means pouring, you know, boiling water onto it, stirring it up and covering it, and then leaving it hopefully like a total of three hours, but we'll see how long we have. It'll get better with more time, but fine. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, so we'll just meet back here in the kitchen in ten minutes. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. I think that I just bent that spoon. <laughs> Let's have fun. Let him take it. The spoon. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So, I'm pretty sure we're going to need a bit more water. Okay. Right. More boiling. Mm. I, I did it. Did you see some yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so maybe we find something that's not plastic. I would do what Dave was saying. A wall, I mean, maybe. you know, I think it'll be fine. Right yeah. Well, it's not, the steam's not that hot. Yeah. There was also a mention of this log. Yeah. It's that worked. This spoon? No. <laughs> no, it's just bent. No. Was it made of plastic? No. It's a. Uh, just uh yeah. yeah it's just wow. probably some kind yeah. of tin alloy. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> All right, yeah, just to cover that up, we'll add a little bit more water. Sometimes yeah, I just that's great. Yeah. Some sometimes I just use the top of my um, pressure cooker which is big enough to mm -hmm. cover it. Okay, um, so I'm going to need you to move back and I'll clean this again. And wipe it down. Yeah, it's isopropyl alcohol, so it's pretty strong smelling. Is that the same as rubbing alcohol? Uh, there's several different kinds of alcohol that are called rubbing alcohol. Um, ethyl alcohol, which is the kind that's in, you know, beer and wine and spirits and stuff. The, like, pure kind that you use, you know, that you can buy at the store is what we use in the lab. Isopropyl alcohol also works. You want it to be at least 70%. In a humid environment, humid environment like this, you'd probably want it higher. You can buy 90% and you can dilute it down, but because um, it, it absorbs water, you can't expect it to stay at 70 if you sort of uh, leave it sitting. So you might want to make it a little bit more than 70. Ooh, that's dirty. Yeah, so basic idea is just to clean the surfaces. Um, and then, and one for the doctor. Uh, we're going to use this as the space uh, where we make our transfers. So this is what I was saying when I was talking about not liking glove boxes and having to make those is I use this instead, which I'll explain as we go. Now I'm, I'm just going to clean the inside of it. And the whole purpose of this is creating a space that's somewhat deep uh, where you can put your cultures and you can put your inoculation material and it's got a shelf that protects it from spore drop and bacteria. It's not going to protect it from everything. I prefer something that's a bit you know, lower and deeper. Um, but this gives you just basically a space that you can clean. You can clean the things you put in it. You should clean the things you put in it. Um, and that uh, for me has been enough. For me and like, you know, that uh, 
is an easy way to do something that could be a lot more complicated. Now I'm just going to wipe this down because I haven't used this one before and it's been sitting because I, I prepared for this class the last time I was here. Um, just making sure, you know, to wipe everything, all the larger material out, which won't necessarily get sanitized by the spray. Cool. And then the next step, um, the prepared jars, are they over there? Thank you. I'll take that. So I'm going to just start out by doing like two to demonstrate. Now these ones are from last night. I made them in preparation. So I'm going to take them and I'm going to set them to the side because I haven't sprayed them down yet. Um, and I'll just close that back up again. Keep it clean. Uh, so yeah, you just want to make sure to clean anything that goes in there so as to throw it out. Um, either they would send you grain spawn or some other kind of mycelial spawn like this, or you would get, you know, agar, which is just a jelly that's got nutrients in it, uh, with mycelium growing on it, and then you'd have to make the initial grain jar yourself. Um, I would suggest ordering something, if possible, like these, um, where there's a firmly, you know, big established colony with lots of material so as to be able to um, have lots of mycelium because if you're going from agar it's you're using a little bit and you know there's a, a more chance that it'll get infected um, you can also use uh, spore syringes um, which some places will sell uh, and that'll work with this method too um, the thing about the agar, though, is that because it's nutrient rich, it also invites other microorganisms. So it's a little more iffy with this method. You could probably do it. I haven't tried, you know? Um, that is more where you'd want a glove box, which again is like, it's like a, a box that's probably on, you could probably set it on a table or it's got feet and it's usually made out of wood, and you've somehow attached, you know, gloves that you can use inside. Diving. Yeah, and, and then, you know, the top is, it can open like this on hinges, and you've got plexiglass or glass or whatever there, and, you know, I would coat the inside in plastic, and then, you know, then you would spray that down, put your stuff in there, let it sit, and then you'd use the gloves. And that, that's got more control of airflow because of the sides. Additionally, you can use a HEPA filter, which is basically just a class of air filter. Um, I, I'll put some on the list of materials that I come up with. I use a Honeywell uh, model, just a home one at home. And you can use that to reduce the spore count in a room or put it in the environmental cabinet or, you know, depending on what kind you have, you can have it so that it, you know, blows clean air past what you're working on so that you have an area that you can work behind where you're only getting clean air. There's different methods. Um, I'm focusing on this one just because of the simplicity, but a glove box, if you want to make it, it's a good thing to have. I just haven't needed one, so. And it's annoying. Yeah, it, again, if you want to use, you know, your cultures like ag agar that you've got more uh, options then, because you can order from the entire catalog of any of these culture distributors, but, um, meh. Yeah. yeah, thank you for answering Yeah. Yeah. I would love 
All right, um, so as with the other things I put in there, the spawn bag also should be cleaned. So I'm going to just spray that down. I'm going to just, then the excess can get in there. Um, yeah, and just, you know, rub it down, try to get all of the crevices and things so that they've got, you know, pr pretty much just wet with alcohol. And uh, so this is an example of a filter bag, like I was showing earlier. So you can see this is the filter. Because this one was left too long, the fungus has grown through the filter. That's why it looks like that. Um, but this is a micropore filter, meaning that uh, it will let um, oxygen, it will let air exchange happen, it will let humidity through, but it won't let microorganisms through. And I don't think it will let, um, like, water droplets bigger than vapor through. Um, and I'm just going to get this little area in the top here. So this was filled uh, with the substrate and then whatever inoculum they used. Um, so maybe grain spawn, but I don't see any grain in there. So I'm just getting this little space in here where things could hide. Um, and after they put in the inoculum with the substrate, they used what is uh, called as an impact sealer, which is just basically, you know, you press it down, it gets hot for a second, and it melts. <laughs> fancy hair nets. <laughs> yeah, and that's good, yeah. The thing is, is that a little bit of inoculum can go a long way. And again, we don't know how this is going to turn out. Like, this is an older culture. We'll see. It's a learning process, which was part of why I put that at sort of the beginning of the demo today. This is a process for getting a feel for this and it's going to be a process of, um, I'm saying process a lot, of you know learning and doing and learning from that doing. So it's a lot like when we're like, you know, in the field and putting certain things in certain places. That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. This is not still tape. <laughs> it seems to be so old that it is. Sorry. What? The humidity ruins tape. It it seems to have. It's okay. Um, just uh, we can just prop it. I guess okay. there. Okay. So uh, now now we don't need to maintain as much cleanliness. We can just. You know, go in here, we've got our jars. Why don't you take these two? And you take these two. And I'm just gonna demo first. That one still feels warm. Hopefully not too warm. Huh. Okay, well, um, yeah, so now what we're gonna do is to, to move the mycelium through the grain medium. So the inoculum through the grain medium. We're just gonna take it, you know, and you know, give it, give it some shakes, you know, cover the, cover the top and you can give it different angles. <laughs> Have a little dance party with your mycelium. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, again, the whole idea is getting all of those points of inoculation to mix through. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of those times we want Beyonce in the background. Yeah. For this. <laughs> beehive. The new beehive. Okay. So this kind of, is this kind of what you're looking for? Yeah. Like I mean, you know. Nice mixed yeah. up. You you. What are, what are you? The clumps I know you're talking about. That's just unavoidable with what we're using right now, right? Yeah, and that's fine. Okay. You know. Ultimately, we're hoping to go grain to grain, mm -hmm. you know, keep our master grain yeah. that we use to make our 
the, yeah, well, well to, to, we're going to use the first one that we know we've got a culture, we really like it, and we'll use that to expand it, and then we'll keep a good one from that as our new master, okay. Okay. and then go so, from there. So this is just our starter from right. the ideas to make the master wrong. grain to create okay. the grain spawn. Well, we can we hope. We'll, we'll, Oh no, I know. The thing is, is I appreciate humor, but um, I can also be quite literal when I'm teaching, so I'm laughing on the inside. <laughs> um, so yeah, and you know, just checking, see if there's any holes. I'm noticing there's a little hole there, so I'm going to put a bit more aluminum on there. Yeah. <laughs> it is fun. Yeah, absolutely. I love this stuff. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can just set those down here. So, David, we should have a race. See whose jar produces first. <laughs> <laughs> These are not, these are not inoculated, yeah, uninoculated. So, we should store these. These jars that we have, like, that we prepped and, and already uh, pressure cooked, mm -hmm. should they be kept in a sterilized place or does it not matter? I mean. Unless we're opening. It does. Okay. It, it, I mean, you want to keep them clean, okay. but um, you know, again, you just spray this down and then close it up. Gotcha. Oh yeah. So once it's done pressure cooking, um, you release the steam. You can't open it while it's still pressurized, otherwise you'll really incur some burns. Some David burns. Uh, it's, it smells like grape. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't I haven't used wheat berries before. I like them. They're plump. Um, <laughs> the uh, the rye rye are a bit longer. And they they have a bit more um, I don't know umph to their shell, so they don't break as easily. Um, so they're they're not they're actually not grain. They're berries. Um, the grain is, uh, or well, no, they they are the grain. They're not seeds. Seeds are different than berries. Yeah. Or grain. Grain and berries, I think, are both words for the same thing. It might just be the kind of plant or something like that. Uh, it's a different, it's a, so with what I know about this is it's just it's a different place. I don't actually know very much about that. Yeah, I think Yeah. If I had to guess, the seed may have been in there Rye. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know nothing. I just use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to also clean something that we can put these in. Since they're inoculated, we want to keep them safe. Um, so I'm going to get another box real quick that we can use.
Excuse me. Oh, I tried to catch all their spores. Spores. <laughs> well, that's good. Hi, Yomi. Hi. Do you want to? What? Weird. Wow. Maybe a couple extra. Yeah, you're ready to go. Huh. That is weird and gross. A little too much. No, oh, there's some like slime at the bottom. Oh no, ew. Okay. This is extra. Thank you. Yeah. So this is probably a really prime example of why you enjoy the that sheet plastic so much, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that that sheet plastic is just like a like construction grade yeah. plastic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like I've got a box of it over there if you want to check it out. We'll also be using it shortly. Okay, so um, I'm just going to put these in here. I'm going to uh, just loosen the lid like so. You can sort of feel it so, so that it can have air exchange. And then, yeah, we'll just put those in there. You know, we could spray them down real quick. And so just to make sure I heard you correctly, this is the process where now that it's inoculated, you want to make sure that you're on top of your cleanliness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the whole reason is just you're trying to limit the chances for infection. Gotcha. Um, and I don't know where the tops for these went. Oh, yeah, I think I left them in this other closet. If you get the big one, um, the, sorry, the big top, then I can just cover it. I don't think it'll fit. The big top will be good. I think I left the tops for these in the closet over there, which we'll get shortly. I'm just covering it. For now. Yeah. To prevent sport drop. Yeah. I'm just yeah. making sure I can. Oh, you got it. it. You got it. Yeah. Um, not at all. Not at all. So, you can also just put these in there. Ow. While well, they're still hot. I'm not going to do that. I'm worried about it melting. And, yeah. When, when they come out, just give them a shake. It's not expanding at this point. Anyway, um, so we're going to let those cool down. And while we do that, uh, we can move on to the next section. I feel like we've kind of covered basic sanitation at this point. Um, and the inoculation box, its purpose, and the different options. Um, and, uh, okay, so the next thing we can cover real quick is incubating um, the newly inoculated jars. Um, during the vegetative growth stage, most fungi prefer darkness. It's not absolutely necessary, but it'll be better. So. You can get a larger uh, Rubbermaid that's black plastic, black top. Doesn't need filters put on it or anything. You can just put them in there. Um, clean it first and then put it in the sort of temperature range that is good for that incubation. 
And I'm going to be providing materials that have resource uh, that uh, talk about what temperatures each fungi generally like. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you can yeah you can look up individual strains as well because there is some variation. Um, for instance, my hope is to get a strain of oyster mushrooms that's specifically uh, high heat so that you can have that uh, here. I'm also going out on a mushroom hike uh, to collect some wild um, and then I can maybe produce a culture from that which uh, would also be good because then it's, it's adapted to growing wild in the islands. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean um, wild capture, and we'll go over that a little bit, um, maybe while we walk and talk, um, is another way that you can build up your culture <laughs> library and you can get things that are adapted for a given environment. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to build the environmental cabinet. And I was thinking we could do that over, well, now I'm just thinking it's, yeah, it's pretty heavy. So we might just want to do it here and move it there. Okay. Um, you can always bring uh, the truck to move it. That might be good. Yeah, because um, the, 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 the metal shelving things are really heavy. So then we can go over to the packing shed. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to need a little bit of help with some of the stuff we need to take. Sure. Uh, it's over there. Are we done with our gloves? Yeah. yeah. All right, gloves off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, I can yep. go ahead and grab all this. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, what do so I need? So then are we... We're going to go ahead and keep these things here for now. Yeah, they can just sit here for now. I, yeah, I teach somewhat slower than some people, but I like it because it gives me the opportunity to answer questions and go in depth. 